Hi all. I just want to first acknowledge what a wild place the world is right now. We're living in a unique moment in history, and it's bringing out a lot of people. Some great, some not so good. In light of the current pandemic, I chose to rewrite and restructure a lot of this video. Uh, though I think the main message is still vital, it's important for us now more than ever to be able to communicate. What? Hi, Hi there. there. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for startling you. I understand this might be frightening. frightening. You no doubt are needing some answers right about now. Who are you? How did you get on my laptop? Are you a virus? I'm Erik Tuven. You may also call me the Traveler. I'm currently in a space vessel orbiting your Earth. I realize I didn't ask in advance if I could transmit to your device, and I do apologize for that. But I believe what I have to say may be a uniquely helpful tool in your toolbox during this current situation your planet finds itself in. I will end the transmission after our conversation, and I will leave your device exactly as it was. Okay, I'm listening. Thank you. I was born on a planet well beyond the edges of your solar system. It was a rough world and we a shallow people. No conflicts in our world were ever resolved without violence. Don't get me wrong. We knew in theory how we wanted to be, peaceful and kind. But the principles we touted, community, integrity, healing, in the end they were just hollow words. Everyone was talking, but no one was listening. Even those who had the potential to be allies, or even friends, were given no second chances. We didn't cherish growth. We weeded out anyone who made a mistake. Every single person was replaceable, disposable. Our species has such an infinite capacity for knowledge and growth, but when there was a chance for a learning moment, we struck each other down. And while we were so busy self-cannibalizing, we were oblivious to the even greater threat which rose up and exploited the widespread discontent and misery plaguing our species. This threat was an initially small faction who advocated militarized intervention to bring order. They thought they could force unity with a hard hand. At first they overtook all the news outlets and only disseminated information that made them look like saviors. I snuck away in those early days, before they'd fully restricted private space travel. I stole the ship from my work, where I was employed as an engineer, and had training as a reserve pilot too in case of emergency. Maybe I am a coward. But I didn't believe we had the cohesiveness to defeat this threat. Initially, I set out to find allies I could bring back to my world. Warriors from another planet. But. I have yet to find life forms with weapons advanced enough to stand a chance against the faction. Instead, I have found diplomats and counselors and philosophers across the universe who have studied and taught effective communication. Communication to defuse conflict. Communication to connect and unite despite disagreements or differences. I hope to bring these methods back to my planet and see if we can bring about peace and unity. So, why are you talking to me? I'm not a diplomat. You are not the first Earth person I've been in contact with. I had the pleasure of chatting with one of Earth's leading experts on nonviolent communication. And I must say, the framework she outlined for me was almost identical to the most effective communication tools I had witnessed across the galaxy. Your species already has the tools for successful nonviolent communication. And I believe you're underutilizing this precious resource. All I'm doing is spreading word, as you say. Still, <laughs> why me? My initial AI analysis reported that you were one of the least likely humans to publicly claim an alien encounter. Uh... I don't know how I'm meant to feel about that. 
This human expert specializes in communicating across differences. We had a fantastic chat and I think you will find what she has to say highly enlightening. My name is Roxy Manning and I've been practicing nonviolent communication since 2002. And I'm also a licensed psychologist. And I find nonviolent communication has made my life a lot more wonderful because it's giving me permission and freedom to be myself. And I share NVC with the world because I want to give other people permission and freedom to be themselves in the hopes that we can find more peace and harmony when everyone is truly their authentic best self. So an important question is, what is nonviolent communication? That question has two answers. The most important answer, and the answer that's often not actually attended to, is that nonviolent communication is a story about how the world works. And this story says that Anything that any being does is an attempt to meet a need. The only reason we take action is because there's something that we value that we're trying to attend to. A big question then is what are needs, right? And needs are something that's universal, that motivates life. An example of a need might be a need for acceptance and belonging. Everyone wants to know that they're part of some system. We might have differing degrees of intensity around how much belonging matters to me. And in any given moment, I might be more or less connected to how important belonging is to me. But if you asked every single person, was there ever a time in your life when knowing that you belonged, knowing that you mattered was important to you? Almost everyone would say yes. It's not necessarily important to me right in this moment, or not the most important thing for me right in this moment, but I can understand that as something that motivates human life. And because we all share these needs, we can understand why people might take different actions. We can have a million different things that we do to attend to our needs, but at the heart, anything that we do is our best strategy to get our needs met. That's the consciousness piece of NVC, that we can find connections among life if we connect to what are the important values that we're trying to attend to in any given moment. The second um, part of the answer to what is nonviolent communication is that it's a communication model. So there's a model that's been developed that helps us to convey what's important to us and understand what's motivating our behavior or someone else's behavior in any given moment. So it's a way to put language to the consciousness part of this understanding that everything that we do is motivated by our attempts to meet our needs. That communication tool has four parts. The first part is observations, then feelings, then needs, and then requests. We pay attention to our observations so that we can have shared reality about um, what's stimulating our need, what's helping us to connect to what we're valuing in any given moment. And we pay attention to our feelings as almost like that early warning signal, the canary in the cave, that lets us know, ah, there's something going on, there's something that's important to us. If I'm feeling really positively about something, it's letting me know that something that I value is being met. And if I'm feeling negatively about something, it's letting me know that something that I really value is not being met. And then we have our needs, which is the heart of NBC, right? It's what is it that I'm valuing in this moment? What's the thing that's most important to me? And then the last part about that communication model is what do I want to do about that? Now that I understand what's important to me, what I value, is there something that I can ask of myself or of someone else or of the universe that will help me better attend to what's important to me? That's the communication model. As you can imagine, you can use that model without the underlying consciousness. And that consciousness being that we all share these same needs. We all value the same things. And if I use just the tool without the consciousness, I can actually lose connection and use it in a way that people find manipulative. But when I use the tool with the consciousness, I can actually find a way to create more connection both with myself and with other people. The last piece that I'll say about that is I often remind people that the tool is basically like training wheels on your bike. So you don't have to talk all the time in this very stilted, what is the observation and what am I feeling and what am I needing and what is the request? I do that if I want to help remind myself that my feelings are connected to my needs or 
and that it's not really about someone else, or if I want to understand what's important to me, to invite myself to looking at that in any given moment. But once I'm really, really connected to the consciousness, and I'm using that as my, the way that I orient myself, um, I can stray away from the communication tool, from the model, and just connect to the heart of what's important to me. So we use the communication tool as the training wheels or the reminder to stay true to what the heart of NBC is, which is all human beings, all beings, take every action as an attempt to meet needs. And if we can understand the needs, we can find paths to better connection. It is my belief that if my people study and learn how to best communicate and to really listen to each other with the same intention and openness that we study history or engineering or who is more likely to win next year's three ball championship, we may be able to unite our species in compassion and vulnerability. The concept of nonviolent communication is not new. It became popularized in your world partly through the work of Marshall B. Rosenberg. Rosenberg was particular about expressing that nonviolent communication is not about compromise. He wrote, Most attempts at resolution search for compromise, which means everybody gives something up and neither side is satisfied. Nonviolent communication is different. Our objective is to meet everybody's needs fully. Does that even work? Let's turn to a fantastic real world example. A person who seamlessly and consistently uses nonviolent communication in their everyday life is non-binary model Rain Dove. This person pepper sprayed me in a women's restroom a little bit ago. I didn't get to converse with this being because this person just sprayed me and ran past with their kids in terror, asking the security guard to come in and confront me. I wasn't even able to get the human's name because of the chaos and the washing. Proves being so awkwardly painful with contact lenses. But it happens moderately often, especially while traveling, that people get scared or volatile when I go into the restroom, so I just shrugged it off and continued life. Then suddenly out of the blue, this person contacted me again. We had a conversation and here's how it went. We have a Skype convo schedule with a trans friend of mine as well to get another perspective. In exchange, we're buying this person lunch via delivery. Just get the education out there. Stop the pain. Hola. I'm the mother that maced you in the ladies' room last week, and I'll do it again. I hope that pepper spray burnt the f out of you. I think it's sick that you go into ladies' rooms and you encourage others to do it on your social media. Go to the one your ID says to. Keep your nasty dick away from us. Why, hello there, friend. I'm glad you reached out. I was so tied up washing out my eyes and talking to the security guard, I didn't get to say what I wanted to say before you left. Number one, here's my ID. But you didn't look like one. Why would you say that? IDK. I was going to say short hair, but I guess she could have been a person with cancer or a meth addict or just a dyke. I guess because you're tall, but I guess female basketball players are tall too. Your face though was really manly. Mm -mm. That's what did it for me. The face. I get that a lot. That's why growing up I always felt that the F stood more for this. Fail. Dang, that's heavy. What I wanted to say to you before you left so quickly was that while you hurt me, I still admire your bravery. You were protecting yourself and your children against what you believe to be a tall cis man coming into the restroom. With many warnings growing up about getting hurt or even raped in the bathroom by deviant men, it's easy to be brainwashed into thinking that anyone that is what society seems to be a penis bearer will have negative or sexual intentions when in an intimate space. You did what you thought was right in the moment and that takes courage. Dang, does this happen often? More than it should, yes. I'm sorry. That sounds like you're the brave one. Dang. I don't get this trans stuff. What if next time it definitely is a man in the ladies room? How do I balance between being fair and not judging with protecting myself and my kids? Good question. Thanks for asking. That was my number two point. <laughs> Pun not intended. First of all, it's great that you want to drop the judgment because there's no way to look like a girl or a boy. Everyone just looks like themselves. So seeing them as an individual is really important and respectful. If you see them as an individual, then you can assess them as an individual as well. Look at their actual actions as an individual. If a person is advancing on you, using inappropriate or threatening language, or brandishing their genitalia in a way that is not aimed at a toilet or urinal, then act in a sensible way that's self-protective. Otherwise, who cares if someone with the opposite genitals is in the room with you? 
And it's not like their splash back onto the toilet seat will impregnate you or give you an STD. And even if that were a concern, no matter who's been on the toilet, I always recommend wiping it down before taking a squat. I feel dumb now. Don't. You just evolve to the next level of humanity. Celebrate it and take others with you. I still don't like trans people in the bathroom, but I won't mace anyone next time. That's really the basics of all we, those that are not commonly aesthetically conforming or trans, ask. Keep your hands and eyes to yourself and we'll keep ours to ourselves. The poop will come out, the pee will be free, it's all good, I promise. Rain Dove was under no obligation to engage with this person. What this person did was assault and definitely illegal. But Rain Dove was thinking not just about themselves. They had the good of the entire trans and gender non-conforming communities in mind. If they came back at this person with anger, this person would likely not have learned anything and would have just gone on to assault the next trans person she saw using the women's restroom. Instead, Rain Dove guided this person to reflect and reconsider. And the outcome is that Rain Dove's words likely saved another trans person from getting pepper sprayed in the face. This is the power of non-violent communication. My child is sick due to you. Oh no, did I give them the flu? No, mental problems. She wants to be a boy. Did he tell you that? She asked for a strap thing for her chest for Christmas. They may not be wanting to identify as male then. Many people wear binders and still identify as female or non-gender. How are you feeling about it? Does it feel a bit heavy? My child hates her body because of perverts like you is how I feel, Imo. I can imagine it must feel a bit like they're rejecting you when they reject parts of their body. For you to be spending your time reaching out to me, it shows you must care a lot about their happiness and well-being. Duh, I care. Rude to think I don't. Oh, you said I do care. Yeah, I do. I'm not going to be an absent cell phone millennial parent and neglect her. They're lucky to have someone so willing to protect them and be present. Tech really has made a dent in family relationships, hasn't it? Refreshing a millennial says that. <laughs> well, it's true. So what did you say to your kid about getting them a binder? Obviously no. I'd love to suggest you get one, especially because you are a caring parent. I'll even hook you up with a great site for them. No. I refuse supporting my child hating her body and I'm not a bad parent for that. I didn't say you're a bad parent. I said you're a caring parent. The reason a binder is great is because they are, medically, a much safer option than alternatives your kid may be turning to when you're not around. Binding with ace bandages, tape, and even torn fabric, it can lead to broken ribs, lacerations, and lung deformation if the material isn't stretchy. Why would she do that to herself? There are many reasons people may want to bind, from gender dysphoria to social discomfort. It may be confusing to you and even feel painful to witness, but if you push them away when they're expressing vulnerable truths about themselves, it could lead to self-harm or even an environment for suicide. Would you rather have your child in your life or gone forever? A little piece of medically approved fabric can literally save their life. One that you clearly adore and care about. I want her alive and happy, I guess. I just want her to love herself. She's beautiful. It's easy to love ourselves when we feel loved as ourselves, no matter where we are on our paths. You must have really created a space of open communication and safety for them to have asked you for a binder. That's special. You don't want to lose that. I told my Sammy she could tell me anything. That's beautiful. And Sammy did. Will a strap hurt her? If you make sure to use it safely with consideration for the length of time it's worn, and the way it's made, then it will not. I'd love to recommend GC2B. They make amazing ones and will walk you through usage. Bless. If I have more questions I can ask you? Always. The key is that there's a safe space for you to find how to make a safe space for Sammy. I'll help as much as I can because I know you care so much. I'm doing research on the bindings. We'll chat later. Thank you very much for talking me through without being angry. I want her to live a life she loves, that's all. I know you do. So do I. There is a lot of propaganda spread about minorities. We're often painted as like, angry and aggressive. And if someone's coming at us with these preconceived notions of how we are in the world, then we can find ourselves in the unfortunate situation of having to guide some of those people towards unlearning these false perceptions before they can even begin to hear and process what we have to say. We've all been raised in the same society. 
Many LGBT people unlearn a lot of these toxic ideas early on. While many straight cis folks, they just haven't been put in positions that necessitate that unlearning. Clearly, it's not any one person's responsibility to guide anyone else towards unlearning hurtful ideologies. But at the same time, if you don't, then who will? This isn't to guilt trip you into doing a bunch of emotional labor that you're not ready for or interested in. I believe that utilizing nonviolent communication with those that come at us with ignorance and anger is a core part of social justice activism. Being tender but not fragile through someone else's unlearning process can be so powerful. Precisely. Someone, Someone commented, commented saying how much emotional labor Rain Dove must do to communicate in this way, but I found that implementing nonviolent communication can feel surprisingly less strenuous than you might imagine. I think because instead of feeling attacked by another person, when you really implement NBC, you can sidestep their slings and arrows and really engage with that person themselves instead of the person's attack. Huh. It's kind of like emotional Aikido. Aikido is a modern Japanese martial art developed by Morihei Oishiba as a synthesis of his martial art studies, his philosophy, and his religious beliefs. Uishiba's goal was to create an art that practitioners could use to defend themselves while also protecting their attackers from injury. So nonviolent communication is kind of like emotional Aikido. However, if you find this kind of communication tiring, you're absolutely allowed to set boundaries. Setting a boundary could look like just ignoring someone or blocking them or deleting their comment if it's in a space that you moderate. Or setting a boundary could sound like this. If you're not going to come at me with compassion and curiosity, then I'm not going to engage in this dialogue. Feel free to rephrase your approach in a way that doesn't presuppose the outcome of this discussion. Well said, though. I personally do find nonviolent communication to be less strenuous than other forms of conflict resolution that I've attempted in the past. Before engaging in a dialogue with someone you disagree with, or someone you're having conflict with, or someone you're about to have potential conflict with, first consider, what do you actually want from the situation? Are you looking for genuine conflict resolution? Or are you just wanting an apology but won't settle for anything else? Or do you really just want to wail on someone? Sometimes we feel so hurt that all we want to do is just hurt the other person back. We want to punish them. That feeling is valid, but no good comes of acting on that feeling. Threatening someone or trying to make them feel shame or guilt may feel productive at the time, but as Marshall Rosenberg writes, well, would you like to read this one? We all pay dearly when people respond to our values and needs, not out of a desire to give from the heart, but out of fear, guilt, or shame. Sooner or later, we will experience the consequences of diminished goodwill on the part of those who comply with our values out of a sense of either external or internal coercion. They too pay emotionally, for they are likely to feel resentment and decreased self-esteem when they respond to us out of fear, guilt, or shame. Furthermore, each time others associate us in their minds with any of those feelings, the likelihood of their responding compassionately to our needs and values in the future decreases. But what if someone has done something that has left you so deeply hurt, and you're finding it difficult to find compassion in yourself to respond with anything other than outright anger? One of the places where people have challenges with NVC is some belief that NVC means I have to be nice to everybody all the time, or that I can't be angry. I remember once I was gonna go teach NVC, and the person who was inviting me was inviting me to work with former soldiers. And they said, you know, you can't be this kind of nice Buddha person, because that's not gonna match their life. It's not gonna match the struggles that they faced. And I wanna talk a little bit about that, because one of the first things I tell all my students is that NVC is not about being nice, it's about being real. And that means that you're allowed to get angry. You're allowed to have difficult emotions. What NVC is inviting us to is to understand what's motivating that and to express it in a way that it's more likely to get heard. So for instance, if somebody did something to me, let's say I was walking down the street and someone insulted me, 
I can say like, wow, I'm really upset that you said that. But instead of going straight to, and you're a jerk, you're a horrible person, I can invite myself to think about why would they even say that in the first place? And I can connect to what's motivating them, right? It might be that that person had a really bad day and somehow it just came out and it's not even really directed at me. My understanding and holding compassion for their experience doesn't mean that I'm condoning what they did. So I could say something like, I'm really getting that you've been super frustrated and this was just one more straw that kind of broke your back and you know this came out in a way that you didn't like and I'm really sad that you're having such a bad day and really genuinely feel compassion for their experience. But I can also say, and when you speak to me in that way, it's actually hard for me. Um, I'm wanting to be held with a lot more respect and care and also some recognition that I also have bad days. And us doing this to each other isn't really gonna work. So NVC doesn't mean that my expressing compassion for your experience also means that I'm in agreement with the strategies that you're using to attempt to take care of yourself. So you can engage in a conflict situation that you found yourself hurt by without the intention of escalating that conflict. Hmm. I think people engage in conflict situations for three different reasons. Conflict resolution, to let the other person know how hurt you are without necessarily sinking or expecting conflict resolution or results, and to hurt the other person. I think a lot of people engage in that last one while thinking they're engaging in the first one. And often the reason that a person's response is to lash out is because they're triggered. Right-wing media personalities have managed to build up this extreme culture of guilt and shame around being triggered. Whereas I think everyone gets triggered. Yes, even nationalists. Whereas I, for example, who don't get triggered by seeing a flag burning, respond differently. It's the same stimulus, different response. I just see a piece of cloth on fire, I feel pretty neutral about it. Something that might trigger me is being called a homophobic slur in public because it draws on lived experiences that I've had that have been very scary. Whereas a straight man calling his straight friend a homophobic slur in a different setting might not land as intensely. I think many right-wing critics of the left, especially the ones that make triggered feminist and triggered non-binary compilation videos, just take it to mean the Urban Dictionary meaning, which is triggered is when a person gets their feelings hurt. I would say it's much more than that. I think it's a physiological reaction where you feel as though you've been peeled into a heightened state of being. This often looks like anger or results in actual anger. And anger is an emotion which stems from fear. Those same right-wing critics would probably say they never get triggered, but all you have to do is watch one of them get road rage, and it's pretty obvious that they're having the exact same physiological response. Most of what road rage is, is people getting triggered. Road rage sounds like an anger problem. It probably is some of that. I think it almost always comes from a fear response. Fear of being in danger when another driver does something that you perceive as threatening your own safety or the safety of your loved ones. Or maybe fear of something more within your control, like fear you're going to be late to work again and worry that your boss might fire you. I might have a history of getting triggered on the internet, but I'm proud to say that I don't get road rage. I might experience something that's scary, but I always manage to keep a hold of my connection to my higher communication skills. For example, Oh wow, that person was driving quite dangerously. That doesn't feel safe. Well, me yelling at them isn't going to help the situation. So what can I do to make myself feel safe? I can start by not driving anywhere close to them. So let's move over here. All right, now I'm in a safety space. Now we can process what's going on. Fantastic. Fantastic. You're all already, already practicing, practicing self-empathy. <laughs> Only sometimes. If we look back at Rain Dove's Instagram account, 
We see that one of the responses to the non-violent communication approach was a message saying, I think I hate everyone because I hate myself. I believe that self-empathy is the first step towards heightening your empathic awareness for other people. The easiest person in the galaxy for you to understand and learn the needs of is yourself. Once you understand the underlying needs of your own thoughts and behavior, it's easier to recognize those same needs in other people's behavior. Empathy can be taught, and empathy can be learned, and greater empathy can lead to greater care and connection. Marshall Rosenberg asserted that, if we don't value our own needs, others may not either. And it works the other way too. Self-empathy and self-respect are important practices that are mutually beneficial to you and the other people in your life. Having needs may be selfish. In fact, the ability to express your own needs can be key to conflict resolution because it helps give the other person clarity about where they are coming from. One of the things that many of us experience is getting triggered. An example for this, and getting triggered in a way that's way above and beyond what the actual stimulus is, right? I was waiting outside a store, and when I got out of my car to help an older woman who I saw coming out of the store with bags, uh, there was a banana peel on the ground, right? And it's just a banana peel. But when she walked past me, after I opened the door for her and she saw the banana peel, she said something like, you people are always so messy. And I got so angry, <laughs> like really, really angry. The statement was, you know, relatively innocuous. We can go into why that was a microaggression, what was going on with that. But what I really got was that my anger and the intensity of it was about much more than just the statement that she made. And this happens a lot for many of us that we have a history and we, we all come with a huge history. And so little things that might seem little to other people land into this big pool of wounds and history and past that we're, that we're carrying. And it stimulates a lot of pain. And our reaction is much more disproportionate. What do we do in those moments? There are a couple of things. First, 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 and this is so important, is to hold compassion for yourself. There's a way that we judge ourselves like, oh, I'm making such a big deal about this. I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. And we don't give ourselves permission to feel and experience what's our truth. And I think it's really important for us to say, yes, for whatever reason, what's happening right now is really huge for me. It's creating a lot of fear, it's creating a lot of anger, and that's my experience. And be able to separate out um, the emotion that's coming up with us with some sense that I have to act on it. This is a place where I find NVC really helpful because NVC invites me to connect to the emotions and the feelings that are coming up and then also to slow down and pause and to separate out is this emotion coming up because of that external stimulus, the thing that the person said or did? Or is it coming up because there's some bigger need, something that's important to me that was stimulated by what that other person said or did? And if I can connect to what that larger stimulus is, what the history is that might have um, been connected to, or what, what larger need has been going so unmet for me for so long, then I can understand myself a lot better hold a lot more compassion for myself, and then my response will be more appropriately directed to where it needs to be. It might be telling that other person, when you said that, it landed in this experience that I have so often. And my reaction is coming more from this pattern of experiences than really the specific thing that you said or did. And I'm wanting some understanding for how many times I've had this experience and why it's so painful for me. So NVC helps me to connect to what's important to me and also to hold compassion when things get really big. I'm going to let you in on a lesson known fact. We are all traumatized. Life, it's traumatic. One possible side effect of trauma is that you can gain a greater understanding of other people's pain, and that can bring about more empathy. Another side effect is that traumatized people can be mean. Traumatized people can be cruel. In autumn of last year, I voiced a line in another YouTube video that a friend of mine made, a real friend, somebody I actually know in real life. And when the video came out, I liked it, so I shared it on Twitter. 
About 48 hours later, I started getting death threats into my business inbox, all mentioning my endorsement of some guy I'd never heard of. And I get death threats occasionally. That's also bizarrely just a part of my life. I had other things to focus on. I figured somebody had a wire crossed somewhere, so I just sort of tuned it out. But they kept on coming. I got death threats. I got encouragements of suicide. I was accused of various crimes and perversions. My personal life was speculated on. My loved ones were insulted. At one point, my personal information was just posted publicly. Some people even went through my mental health videos to find the specific words that would hurt me the most, which points for effort, at least. A lot of this was going on on Twitter. I have been targeted in the past by three hate mobs, neo-Nazis, transphobes, and this one. And this one was unquestionably the most venomous yet. People were speculating about my private life. People were insulting my, my loved ones and my friends. Um, I got doxxed. Uh, I, I was accused of various crimes and perversions, and I have committed various crimes and perversions, but none of the ones that I was being accused of. Um, but yeah, basically, it, it was the worst week I've ever had on the internet, even, even worse than the time the neo-Nazis uh, found me a couple of years ago. Let's just sit with that for a moment. Oliver Thorne said that his experience of getting backlash from appearing in opulence was worse than the time that Nazis Actual, literal neo-Nazis doxxed him. They got his address. And that experience was still not as bad as when he appeared in the same video as a transmedicalist, for which he got death threats. When your trauma causes you to lash out with such violence, your anger is no longer righteous or justified. You have the right to those feelings but you're not entitled to oppose your trauma on the others. It is my belief that your responsibility as an adult in society is that you don't impose your trauma on others. And yes, it sucks, because your trauma is not your fault. But it's also not the fault of the person whose actions have most recently triggered your trauma response. From what I've seen, there are two kinds of mass shooters. One is the far-right extremists who believe that there is a superior way to be human and that they need to eradicate everyone who doesn't fall into that category. The other kind of mass shooter, they're people who have been abused, who have been bullied, who have come from broken homes or broken families, and they've been raised on pain and shame. But at the end of the day, their actions are just as heinous and their victims just as dead. We all had our traumas, didn't turn any of us into psychopaths. Your trauma is not your fault, but handling it now with integrity and respect is your responsibility. If you don't learn how to handle and hold your trauma, it can come out in other ways that traumatize others. And then the trauma cycle never ends. Andrea Gibson writes, Coming into our own humanity often takes enormous effort, commitment, and bravery. I believe we should be taught that at an early age. I believe part of the violence of our culture stirs from the myth that kindness is natural. I don't think kindness is natural. I think kindness would only be natural in a world where no one is hurt. And everyone is hurt. There is no weapon more dangerous than a wound. So when asked if I believe in good people, I say I believe in people who are committed to knowing their own wounds intimately. People who read their wounds diaries, who follow their wounds out windows down ladders asking, where are you going? What do you need? How can I intervene before a cruel thing is done or said? There is no weapon more dangerous than a wound. The truth vibrates through the saying earthling. Thank you for sharing the words of this philosopher with me. I agree that if one learns self-compassion, self-empathy, this is mutually beneficial for everybody. If one learns how to be kind and compassionate towards oneself, and learns to hear and understand one's own needs, one then gets better at seeing the needs behind other people's communication. 
even if someone reaches out in a way that doesn't land well, because needs are universal. Nonviolent communication is of course juxtaposed against violent communication. Marshall Rosenberg wrote, if violent means acting in ways that result in hurt or harm, then much of how we communicate could indeed be called violent communication. If you respond to violent communication with more violent communication, the cycle continues. What we want ultimately, hopefully, is successful conflict resolution. When it comes to trauma, it is, at the end of the day, your responsibility to take care of yourself and to take responsibility for your own words and actions. I think there is a line between holding yourself with integrity and self-care and the pressure to not ever need anyone else and be fully independent and autonomous. So even though your words and your actions are ultimately your responsibility, you're also allowed to ask for help. You're allowed to reach out and say, hey, I'm not doing so well. Something's come up for me and I'm wanting some support right now. And I've learned from extensive experience that that support shouldn't come from the person whose words or actions have triggered you, even if you're both very close. I believe that if you are in a triggered state and you're needing support, you should reach out to someone uninvolved. People ask friends or therapists, some folks even have designated vent buddies. In the Philosophy Tube video, Why the Left Will Win, Oliver Thorne positions shared vulnerability as the glue of leftist communities. And I do believe that is why people come to the left, because we don't see vulnerability or tenderness as a weakness. That if we want to keep people here, we actually need to exist in our own spaces and community with empathy and compassion. The punishment mentality of cancel culture is neither nuanced nor productive. With this mindset, the vitriol against individuals for their sins, whether perceived or actual, doesn't exist on a spectrum. Basically, cool motive, still bullying. I think vulnerability also includes having the humility and self-awareness to know that you may be wrong about something. And also to know that if you're arguing with a person, there might be a chance that you're actually on different pages about what it is you're arguing about, but you might actually agree, so it's okay to ask for clarification, even though it might feel like a silly question. In this story, The Shower Curtain Saga, I make what I think is a really simple, and in my opinion, very reasonable request of my partner. I asked her that when she's finished using the shower, that she opened up the shower curtain so it would have less chance of developing mold, which was an issue in our very small New York City apartment bathroom. So she said yes, and I thought, great, no more problems. The shower curtain's gonna be opened up. But then the next time I went to take a shower, it was scrunched up like it always had been. And then I went into the bathroom a third time and it was also scrunched up the way it always had been. So I got pretty frustrated because I thought we'd already had this conversation and we were clear. So I noticed I was getting more and more irritated. I was actually getting really pissed off. I was thinking, she doesn't care, does she? Like, I already talked to her about the shower curtain. I'm the one who cleans the shower curtain. And she doesn't really care about me that much then, does she? So I decided to go talk to her again. And I was like, what's the deal? I asked you to open up the shower curtain when you take a shower. And like the last two or three times you've taken a shower, it's been scrunched up like usual. And then I found out that she thought she was opening up the shower curtain. She was like, what do you mean? I've been opening it up every time. So I said to her, what do you mean it's open? It's all scrunched up and it can't breathe, so it's gonna get moldy. And she said, no, it's open. It's open like a door so you can pass through. Then I realized that we had very different understanding of what it means by leaving the shower curtain open. She thought that I wanted the air to be able to pass through into the actual shower stall. So she was leaving the curtain scrunched up so that air could get into the shower stall easier. I wanted her to actually spread out the shower curtain like an accordion so the curtain would get less mold. This brought home to me in a really dramatic way just how important it is to have a clear observation when you're speaking with someone, especially about a concern. Arguments often start over something this simple because we think we're making it really clear and the other person says yes and they agree and they think they're clear, but we're actually thinking about two different things at the same time. Now to touch on a not so recent topic, <laughs> Buck Angel. So just to be clear, I'm not condoning Buck Angel. I'm 
demonstrating that nonviolent communication can be used to understand and communicate with someone that you do have disagreements with. So Ray Blanchard wrote, Here is the beginning of the political push to get trans removed from the DSM. All is needed is the new billing code that will pay from hormones and sex reassignment surgeries in the absence of a medical diagnosed condition. To which Buck Angel responded, All our hard work as transsexuals to get respect and transition will now be removed. Get prepared not to have any medical help anymore unless you're rich. Angry face emoji. Angry face emoji. Angry face emoji. <laughs> now, what I find interesting here are all the angry face emojis. I find this interesting because from my experiences and observations, I believe that anger always stems from one of three things, right? It stems from hurt, it stems from fear, or it stems from disgust. I'm not going to touch on disgust today because that's kind of difficult to empathize with, empathize with, but hurt and fear are universal. They're all things we've felt before. Feeling fear and sadness is quite uncomfortable for most people. It makes you feel vulnerable and oftentimes not in control. Because of this, people tend to avoid these feelings in any way they can. One way to do this is by subconsciously shifting into anger mode. In contrast to fear and sadness, anger can provide a surge of energy and make you feel more in charge rather than feeling vulnerable or helpless. Essentially, anger can be a means of creating a sense of control and power in the face of vulnerability and uncertainty. That's from the Psychology Tools, What is Anger? by Kim Pratt. So, is Buck angry? Possibly. But what I see more so than anger is fear. Something is blocking Buck Angel from having an open conversation about the trans experience in regards to people who say they identify as trans but don't experience dysphoria. He's scared, right? It's fair that's driving this tweet. It's clear to me from reading this that Buck believes that if trans people don't need dysphoria to be trans, and if trans is consequently removed from the DSM, he believes that his health insurance will stop covering his life-saving hormone therapy, and that he and other trans people will no longer have access to surgery and hormones. Since in this scenario it would no longer be seen as a medical treatment for a psychiatric disorder, he clearly doesn't trust that the new billing code will pull through and probably feels as though he'll have to start fighting again for his right to access testosterone. Wow, that must be scary for him. He grew up in a time where he had to prove himself to get access to hormones, and he's scared that if the too cute ideology prevails, he'll lose access to what he fought so hard to get in the first place. Deanne Killian says, fear that's unexpressed is almost always experienced by the receiving party as aggression. But Seeing through that aggression and understanding that fear in someone else makes it easier to say, wow, that must be scary. I see your fear. While I disagree with you, I can't understand how you came to that conclusion. And at this point, it can ground me in seeing the other person's humanity in all its fullness. And then I can approach the conversation with empathy. You don't need to agree or disagree with his logic to be able to empathize with his fear. Understanding this fear also makes it immediately clear to me why he's so eager to separate the categories transsexual and transgender. It's his backup plan. If two cute ideas prevail and no one needs dysphoria to be transgender, then Buck will have the safety of his separate category of transsexual, in the hopes of retaining access to testosterone. Like, okay fine, you can take transgender out of the DSM as long as you leave transsexual in, because then transsexuals can continue to have access to trans-related healthcare, right? That sounds like a fair compromise. Now we have a good empathy guess at Buck Angel's blocker. Yes! What, what a fantastic, fantastic example. example. According, According to nonviolent communication, once you understand and empathize with another person's blocker, the best way to have a rational conversation with them about the relevant topic is to address their fears and feelings surrounding the topic first, before diving into your own position. Starting the conversation with something like, he? I see, I see that you're worried about losing access to your healthcare. Damn, that must be really stressful. Just that little bit of understanding, leading the conversation with empathy, can set a tone of mutual respect for the entire conversation. So why do you think two cute should even bother attempting conflict resolution with trans medicalists? Or why should trans medicalists even bother attempting nonviolent communication with two cutes?
I spoke with a radical fairy friend of mine recently, a gay man who lived through the AIDS crisis and saw half his friends die within a four year period. A man who has lived in multiple LGBT communities and has learned what it means to foster and sustain community connections in minority groups. And he said to me, we do ourselves as a community a dishonor to dispose of relationships and to consider relationships disposable. We don't all need to be friends, but I truly believe that we need to sustain community. And to do that, we need to learn how to work through conflict and how to keep our community relationships intact. There are too few of us as it is. Our relationships cannot be disposable. I was about to do a retreat, and the retreat was on diversity and equity and creating bridges across differences. And so my assistant posted an announcement for the retreat on Facebook. And in response, someone wrote back with this really intense diatribe against the work that we were doing. and. Like started off by calling us like social justice warriors and snowflakes and a lot of negative language, but then started talking about um, we don't understand what pain is and uh, they were going to make sure that we learned what pain was. So this was terrifying on a number of levels. First, there was this person's anger about the work that we were doing, and then also the threats that they were going to make sure that we understood what pain was because that was the only way that we would learn. I was actually amazed at my assistant. He wrote back to this person and was making some guesses around what was important to the person. Why would they post this message? And he was trying to understand, um, was the person feeling threatened and scared that his experience as a white man wasn't being honored and seen and the challenges that he'd face in society wasn't being honored and seen when he thinks about a focus on diversity and equity um, was the person wanting a sense that everyone's value everyone was being valued and that the things that were important to him weren't going to be taken away in order to support someone else so he was making some really important guesses about what was motivating this person to say these things and he also was checking in with the person and letting them know that we would love to connect with you and understand what's important to you around equity because equity for us applies to everyone. And when you make threats, it's actually scary for us because we're not sure how to engage with um, the question of safety for everyone who might come to the retreat if you're going to be threatening us and making us think that there might be physical harm. So there was both acknowledging what might be motivating the person and checking in with them around, do we actually need to worry about physical safety? Is that the message that you're wanting us to hear? Some people might question, like, why would you even guess and make like an empathy guess around what's motivating this person, right? And I think this for me is the heart of NVC, that it's not just about doing things to make my life wonderful, but with NVC, I'm trying to create what Dr. Martin Luther King called beloved community, right? I'm trying to create a world where everybody is welcome and people from all different walks of life, people who are from different backgrounds, different religions, everyone finds community. And in order to find community, it means that even when you're showing up in ways that are painful for me, the only way that I can bring you into my community is if I can show you that I, I can understand and I can invite you to understand me. If the dialogue stays around pushing you away or saying that what you're doing is wrong with no attempts at understanding, we'll never create community. We'll never find that bridge to be able to understand and find a new way of being together. And so I could have just said, oh, we're going to flag this post and call Facebook and maybe call the police and do all of these things. If I did that, I'm pretty sure that that person would never engage with us and nothing will ever change. But by inviting people into dialogue, people start to question like, wow, why did I say that? Though it may seem counterintuitive and sometimes even feel defeatist or as though we're giving up too much power and benefit of the doubt to the other person, if our goal is actual conflict resolution, then we need to extend empathy before we can ask for it. People who are not at first extended empathy will be very resistant to offering empathy to others. When engaging in nonviolent communication, remember, all people have needs. Needs are universal. Empathy can be taught, and everyone has the capacity to grow and change. Nonviolent communication should be initiated with these things in mind. Under the current global circumstances of self isolation, physical distancing, distance socializing, and lockdowns, we really must rethink the way that we communicate. 
There is no reason why we should lose touch with friends or family or community or allies. And we even have new opportunities to forge connections in ways that we didn't before, since a lot of political groups, social groups, and education spaces are taking their outreach online. But we need to keep in mind that a lot of the people that we'll be communicating with, we're not in the same room as, and we don't have that added benefit of tone or, or physical body language. Even through a video call, it can be hard to discern the energy that someone is bringing to the conversation. Therefore, I believe now is the best time to start practicing nonviolent communication. And if it's a challenging conversation, it lets you deal with your emotions as well before responding. When having video calls, you have the added benefit of being able to have a quick note reference guide at your side. I have the one I'll link in the description below. It's nonviolent communication, the workflow, and then a list of feelings and a list of needs. And the person you're having a video call doesn't need to know that it's there. They don't need to see your notes, <laughs> but you can refer to it if you need to. I use these notes when I know that I'm going to have an emotionally charged or challenging conversation, and it really has helped me. It's no longer a hyperbole to say that the fate of humanity rests on your ability to unite and work together. And if you come to the conclusion that conflict cannot be resolved, then it's time to call in your local social justice berserker.